please go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus. We're there once again. Exodus chapter 19 is where we're going to be in just a few moments. We are still in the sermon series I've called Become. And we're going to be in this sermon series throughout the rest of the summer. And in the fall, then we'll kick off a new sermon series. But what we're doing in this sermon series is we are learning what it means to begin to be. To begin to be what exactly? Well, to begin to be everything that God wants you to be. How many of us could agree that there are some things that are lacking in me, even now? Even after I've been following Jesus since I was 11 years old, there are some things that I still need to work on, need to improve, that, that God is going to grow me and show me um, in the future. And so what we're doing is to help us understand what it means to have a life transformed in Christ, as have a life transformed by God. We are zooming in and we're looking at the life of Moses. And his story is all located in the book of Exodus. And so we've been traveling chapter by chapter, almost verse by verse in some cases, studying about the lessons that God taught Moses as he was transforming him to become the man that he would desire him to be. And if you've been following our story, then you know that last week um, Moses had led the Israelites out of Egypt and he was leading them towards Mount Sinai. And on their journey towards Mount Sinai, we learned this one true simple fact. The Israelites were a bunch of complainers. Remember that? And what we learned last week is that, you know what, sometimes we're all a bunch of complainers and that sometimes we've got a, a pattern of complaining in our lives that is not acceptable. Now, I feel like I need to to share this with you as well. Last week, uh, it was brought to my attention that um, as we were talking about this idea of complaining, that um, somebody went on to Burnside Christian Church's uh, Google page and left some reviews of Burnside Christian Church. Remember, we showed you a video about church reviews and how silly sometimes they were. Two of our faithful and, and, and friendly uh, parishioners here at the church decided it'd be fun, and it was. It was made, it made my day. It made me laugh so hard. Mel Roth gave a one-star review of Burnside Christian Church, and he says, the preacher talked about how complaining is a sin all day long, you know. <clears throat> And then Tara Cole got on there and, and put on there too. My husband thought that the communion wine was a little watered down and that the communion bread was a little stale. And I thought, that's, that's fitting too. But anyway, uh, we, we hopeful, I really hope that you grab a hold of those, those promises and those truths uh, about complaining and that you were able to apply them to your life. How did you do with complaining this last week? Uh, you did pretty good because I didn't get too many complaints. Well, now we are in Exodus chapter 19. And now, finally now, the Israelites are led to the base of Mount Sinai. Remember, in Exodus chapter 3, as God was commissioning Moses to go get the Israelites out of Egypt, he said, bring them back here to this mountain so they may worship me. Well, guess what? In Exodus chapter 19, that is about to happen. They've been camped at the base of Mount Sinai, and Moses tells them to get ready to meet God in three days. And so the people get ready. They wash their clothes. They consecrate themselves. What does that mean? Well, it means that they tried their best to live lives that were worthy to worship God. They got themselves ready for three days, and then the moment happens. Let me read these verses for you, because God shows up big time. He doesn't disappoint. In Exodus chapter 19, starting in verse 18, it reads, Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Now, what I want you to, to really grab hold of in these verses is that God showed up, and he shows up big time with fire, with thunder, with smoke, with an earthquake. So not only could the Israelites physically see God's presence, they didn't see God, they saw his presence, they could also hear God's presence. They could smell God's presence as he was raining on top of the mountain in fire. They could smell the smoke and they could feel God's presence as he caused the earth to quake. God did not disappoint. 
in fact, archaeologists believe that this mountain is probably, there's good archaeological evidence to indicate that this mountain is the Mount Sinai that's talked about in the book of Exodus. Remember we told you a few weeks back how archaeologists have, have discovered this mountain that's actually taking place over in Saudi Arabia instead of the Sinai Peninsula and it's it's called uh, the Mountain of God. It, it's, it's, uh, it, it's really a tremendous mountain. Well this is a picture of that mountain that archaeologists believe is Mount Sinai. You can see here at the top of the mountain how it is scorched how it's burnt and as you get closer to it you see you realize that this is not just merely a shadow that these are actually uh, scorched and melted rock on top of this mountain and that's what happens when God shows up to meet his people that's what should happen when God shows up to meet his people. And you're thinking to myself, well, how come that hasn't happened for me lately, God, Mark? How come, how come God hasn't shown up with smoke and with fire and with earthquake? And how come I've not walked away totally impressed when I come to worship him? My question to you is, have you spent three days preparing to worship? Have you gotten yourself ready to be here this morning? And the answer for probably all of us in here is like, ooh, boy, that stepped on my toes a little bit. Nope. I was rushing out the door trying to my best to avoid being late here today. I had no time to really prepare mentally or spiritually to encounter God's presence or to worship him fully. Well, this is what we should expect to happen when God meets up with his people as his people gather to worship him. And so in Exodus chapter 19 verse 20, I want to, I want to draw your attention to the fact that um, the Lord called to Moses and Moses went up to the top of the mountain. In fact, all throughout Exodus chapter 19 through 31, if you did any reading this past week, then you realize that, that God had meetings with Moses time and time again. And boy, a lot of things were discussed and a lot of things were happened. But my question that I want to open up this morning's sermon with for you today is this. Have you ever had a mountaintop experience with God? Has God ever called you to the top of a mountain and you answered his call and you were there and you met with him and you encountered him? Have you ever had a mountaintop experience? My hope for you is that you have. But if you've ever had a mountaintop experience, then you know that that feeling does not last, that that encounter is not a, a permanent encounter. And usually what follows the mountaintop experience is the valley. As a matter of fact, the title of this morning's sermon is, When the Mountain Becomes the Valley. And today, what I want to do as we talk about the mountaintop, I want to give you three truths about the mountaintop. Okay? Here's truth number one. The mountaintop is where God speaks. As we return to our text, Moses spent a lot of his time up on the mountain talking with God. And while he is up on that mountain, God gives him a lot of information, including, and not limited to, the Ten Commandments. We're all familiar with those. The requirements for how the tabernacle was to be built. How to handle personal disagreements amongst the people. How the Ark of the Covenant was to be constructed. The garments that the priests were to wear as they came and offered sacrifices. Time and time again, God gave, gave very detailed instructions, commands, and guidelines. And it was on the mountaintop where Moses was communing with God and where God chose to speak all of these things to Moses. Now, don't misunderstand me here this morning. I'm not specifically saying that God speaks on the tops of mountains, okay? Not physically on the top of mountains. Although it could be. It could be for some of you that that's where you feel the closest to God. What I am saying is this. The Christian journey is filled with mountains and valleys, figuratively speaking. The Christian experience is filled with, with highs and with lows. And throughout the Christian life and Christian experience, you will have mountaintop experiences where you feel closest to God, where you will hear him speak loudly and clearly into your heart. Moments where you will see God moving and directing your paths. It's those moments that I'm referring to as mountaintop experiences. In fact, mountains have always had a significance to God. Time and time again, God has used physical mountains to speak and communicate to his people. 
Mountains are mentioned very frequently in the Bible because they dotted the landscape where the stories of the Bible take place. And as a result, mountains and hills are mentioned more than 500 times in Scripture. In the Old Testament, the mountains of Sinai and Zion are most significant. Mount Sinai is the place where, of course, where we're studying now that Moses received the law, the Ten Commandments. And so Mount Sinai is a symbol of God's covenant with Israel. But then there's Zion to the south. It's located, it's the location of Jerusalem, uh, the temple in Jerusalem. But in the New Testament too, we're told of mountains and hills and how key they were in, uh, in playing a part in God's plans. In Matthew's Gospel, um, we're told that Jesus delivered the Beatitudes in his sermon on the mount, right? The mountain is where Jesus delivered his sermon, his first recorded sermon in Scripture. And Matthew's audience, remember Matthew, as he's writing his gospel, he's writing to a primarily Jewish audience. His audience would have instantly made the connection between Moses on the mountain giving the law and Jesus on this mountain delivering God's new law, the new covenant. In Mark and Luke, Jesus appoints 12 disciples on top of a mountain. Going on further in Matthew, in particular, has significant other mountain scenes in his gospel. How about Jesus' temptation in Matthew chapter 4, verse 8? He's taken to the top of a mountain and shown all the lands. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. A number of healings take place on top of a mountain. Specifically speaking, Matthew chapter 15, verses 19 through 31. But most notably... Probably the greatest um, encounter that God has with his people on top of a mountain comes through the transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17 verse 1. As Jesus' glory is revealed to his inner circle of disciples, Peter, James, and John. They see him transfigure before his, uh, their eyes and they recognize that this is indeed the Messiah. This is indeed God. So God uses mountaintops to speak, sometimes literally, sometimes figuratively. But he always uses mountaintops to make his point, to get your attention. All of that to say this, that if God calls you up to the mountain, you make the journey to go to the mountain. When and where do you feel closest to God? Do you ever have those times in your life where, man, I just feel like the closest to God as I'm, and you fill in the blank. Maybe it's for some of you, you feel closest to God when you are in nature. When you're experiencing God's beauty and his creation. For others, it might be when, when you are um, at a conference or a church camp or, or listening to some speaker speak or engaged in some worship service that's amazing. Where is it that you feel closest to God? That would be your mountaintop experience. If you're having trouble coming up with a mountaintop experience for you, if you're not really sure where you feel the closest to God, let me just tell you, we make them readily available to you all the time. Missions trips, conferences, camps, conventions, the list goes on and on. And what you need to hear this morning is this, make sure you get to the mountain. When God calls you to the mountain, you get to the mountain because it's in that moment that God wants to share with you something amazing. You'll hear God speaking to you, but only if you make time to go there. Moses made time to get to the mountain. As you may have known, I recently returned from spending some time in the mountains of Colorado with uh, some of my preacher buddies. This year there were four of us who went, and then the three of my buddies took, one each, uh, took a son with them as well. And uh, let me just tell you that I could bore you with details of my mountaintop experience because for me, where I feel closest to God is in the mountains of Colorado. I, I, there's just something about it that is truly amazing. And yes, we had lots of adventures. Yes, there are memories that were made there. Things like uh, having to purify your own water, getting snowed on in the middle of June, making a snowman on the, the side of a mountain in the middle of June. 
um, discovering that just a few hundred feet from where we have camp, we found paw prints that were fresh that belonged to that of a mountain lion. Those were all things I'm going to treasure and take with me. But I'm also here to tell you that there were some spiritual lessons that I learned that I believe God was speaking to me very clearly on top of the mountains in Colorado. And so I make a point to go there each and every year because I know that that is when God's going to get my attention, when he's going to speak loudly to me. And um, one of the things I love about Colorado is that I feel so small when I'm there. As you're walking on the side of a mountain and you just see mountain after mountain after mountain and you encounter lakes and you encounter trees that are just, you, you just feel so small. And what I love about that is that even in my smallness, I'm reminded that God loves me. And that's a pretty overwhelming thought. But here's what you must understand. While the mountain is where God speaks, and maybe that's where you're going to feel the closest to God, the mountain isn't where you live. That's truth number two. The mountaintop is not where you live. What I find very interesting with Moses is the fact that he did not live permanently on top of the mountain. I mean, I'm sure that's where he would have liked to have been, kind of removed away from some of the people. But the longest we ever hear of him staying up there at any given stretch is 40 days. It's true, just like the old saying says, what goes up must come down. And so when you encounter God on the mountaintop experience, that's not where you're supposed to live your life. You eventually have to come down off the mountain. The mountain is reserved for special encounters. And so while you're experiencing God at that mountaintop experience, you need to do a few things while you're there meeting with God. The first thing you have to do is you've got to listen to him. Moses had to listen to God. God was speaking, but Moses had to take the time to listen. In Exodus chapter 24, verse 4, it says that Moses wrote down all of the words of the Lord. You think he had to listen to make sure he didn't miss anything? You better believe he did. And so when you are up on top of the mountain, you have to understand that's not where you're going to stay. But while you're there, make sure you listen. Make sure you listen. The problem with our culture today is that while we are wanting to hear a word from God, we have so many other noises in our life that seem to totally drown out what God would otherwise say to us. And you can think very clearly about what it is, the noise in your life that you're too busy to listen to God uh, doing. Maybe it's sports. Your kids are involved in so many different summer leagues. You're on the go all the time. And you've got no time to sit and listen to what the Lord would tell you. Maybe it's your job, a very demanding job. And, and you're just on the go and you're busy and your boss has put pressures on you that, that man, you never had before. And you're, the noise of your job is causing you to be a little bit uh, dismissive of what God would otherwise tell you. You fill in the blank. You know exactly what it is, the noise in your life that maybe you need to tune down just a little bit to listen to what God would tell you. One of the things that I enjoyed about being on top of the mountain in Colorado is that my phone didn't work. I couldn't connect to Facebook. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't. And it was certainly nice to unplug from everything for a little while. And while I was unplugged, you better believe that I leaned in and listened to exactly what God would have uh, to tell me on top of that mountain. And I journaled and I listened and, and I wrote. Not only did Moses had to listen, Moses had to learn. There were so many laws and instructions on how to deal with people matters. I mean, the Ten Commandments were brand spanking new, fresh off the press. And so he had to learn the lessons himself before he could share them with the rest of the people. And that leads me to ask you this this morning. What lessons would God have for you? What is it that God is trying to get you to learn? So we've covered two of the three truths. The first truth being the mountaintop is where God speaks. The second truth is the mountaintop is not where you live. It's where you visit. And here's the third truth, and it's probably the most important truth that I can share with you today. So listen up. The mountaintop prepares you for the valley. The mountaintop prepares you for the valley. 
So put yourself in Moses' shoes. You just spent uh, 40 days on top of the mountain. You've been meeting with God. You've been listening to him. You've been writing down faithfully everything that he's telling you to do. And now he's making his journey down off of the mountain. And this is what he returns to. Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 4. Now when the people saw that Moses was delayed to come down from the mountain, the people ascended about Aaron. Remember Aaron? Aaron is Moses' big brother, okay? He's the one that God placed in Moses' life to help speak when Moses thought he couldn't do it. So Moses is gone. The people look to Aaron. And the people tell Aaron, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. He could be dead. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in your ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took them from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you out from the land of Egypt. Can you imagine? They just saw God part the Red Sea just a few days ago, a couple months ago. And now they're giving tribute and honor and credit to a molten calf made out of gold? Now we skip ahead a few verses, and here comes Moses. It came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger burned, and he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. You guys, Moses is losing his mind, okay? He is crazy with anger. I don't know if you've ever been that angry before in your life. But Moses just received tablet, uh, the word from the Lord. He's bringing them down. He's taking the, the time to do that. He's getting ready to share them. He comes down and he, they're just going nuts. And they're dancing and they're celebrating and they're worshiping a golden calf. And Moses loses it. And he takes those and he smashes them. And notice what it says. He took the calf which they had made and they burned it with fire and he ground it into a powder and scattered it all over the surface of the water and he made the sons of Israel drink it. This is the God you guys want? You want to worship it? I tell you what, you're going to have it. You're going to take it in. We're going to see if it can sustain you with life like God the Father has done for you in the wilderness by giving you manna, by giving you water. Then Moses said to Aaron, and I love this, What did this people do to you that you brought such great sin upon them? And Aaron listened to his excuse. Do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know these people for yourself. They're prone to evil. <laughs> for they said to me, Make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what's become of him. And so I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. And so they gave me their gold. I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. It wasn't my fault. I just threw the gold in there, and out came a calf. Uh, that's not exactly what happened, because as you look back, <clears throat> it says that he took the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a calf. So which is it here, Aaron? Is it your fault, or is it not your fault? It's your fault. Verse 30. On the next day, Moses said to the people, you yourselves have committed a great sin. And I love that. It says, on the next day, Moses said, he had to have some time to cool off before he talked to these people. He's had it up to here with them, okay? On the next day, Moses said to the people, you yourselves have committed a great sin. And now I'm going up to the Lord, and perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, alas, this people has committed a great sin against you, and they have made a God of gold for themselves. And listen, there's great punishment that comes as a result of that sin. You can read about that your own. But can you imagine how you would be feeling if you were Moses? You went from cloud nine, yes, Lord, you are real. I'm receiving everything that you would teach us, that you would want us to learn. You come down off the mountain excited to share what you've learned with the people. And you come to a chaotic, sinful party. Listen, the mountaintop is there to prepare you for ministry in the real world. In fact, if you're taking notes, jot this down. The valley is what makes the mountaintop necessary. 
The valley is what makes the mountaintop necessary. All the stuff that you're going to face in the valley, that's going to be made easier by the fact that you've encountered God on top of the mountain. As you read throughout the Gospels, oftentimes, isn't it true, maybe you've experienced it in your own life, the mountaintop is oftentimes followed by a valley. Let me give you just a few examples. In Matthew's Gospel chapter 3, as Jesus begins his earthly ministry, ministry in Matthew chapter 3, he's baptized by John the Baptist. You remember how that scene unfolds? John the Baptist baptized, baptizes Jesus. And as he does so, the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus in the form of a dove, right? And then the clouds break open and all of a sudden a voice from heaven is heard. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Cloud nine. Mountaintop experience. Everybody knows for a fact this is the Messiah. This is God's son. But then you turn the, the page to Matthew chapter four and what do we see happening? Jesus being led out into the wilderness by the spirit to be tempted by the devil. Mountaintop followed by a valley. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asked his disciples the question, Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, man, he buzzes in and he gives the correct answer. In Matthew chapter 16, uh, he says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds in Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven revealed this to you. I also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will, shall have been bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Mountaintop experience. He's getting um, encouragement and ac acknowledgement in front of his peers. And Jesus says, you are the man, right? But you literally, you literally, just two verses later, listen to what happens in Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 21. And from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up again on the third day. Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> Do you think Peter got a little too big for his britches? He began to rebuke Jesus, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man. Do you see how he had the mountain and then came the valley? And maybe you've got your own example of, of how you were on top of the mountain, you were close with God, you encountered God, you were so sure that he was real. And then shortly after that came the valley. Let me tell you something. Um, the mountain exists to help you with the valley. We need those moments in our lives where we're very close to God. Because we know that in those moments when we're in the valley, if we didn't have those moments when we were so sure that God exists, the valley would be much deeper. The valley would be much darker. It would be much harder. And in those moments where we are on top of the mountain, where we are encountering God, where um, it, our, our faith looks more like fact than faith, those are needed and necessary because the valley is coming. And so as we wrap up our time together, I want to lay before you these two questions yet once again. The first question being this, how does this apply to me? Ask yourself that question. How does what we just study with Moses going on the mountain and then Moses coming down off the mountain into the valley, how does this apply to me? And then ask yourself the question, how does this apply to us? The Christian life is filled with highs and lows. You need to understand that. I wish, I wish every single day could be a mountaintop experience for you and for me. But that's not the reality in which we live. There's going to be highs and there's going to be lows. And so let me ask you here this morning, where are you right now? Are you on the mountain? Or do you find yourself in a valley? And if you're in the valley, how do you get back to the mountain? How do you get back to the place where God is going to speak to you very clearly, where he will lead you very um, um, purposefully? And as a church, let me just say this, that there's going to be moments of highs and moments of lows. 
And we will endure. We need to endure. We must endure through all of it in order to see what God would have us do in the future. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have our time decision here this morning. Let's pray.